Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. What an exciting show I have for you because my guest today is going to really give you a little bit of tantalizing uh, mind effect. Well, let me tell you why. My guest today is a Air Force veteran and an award-winning special effects expert. Not only that, he's an author. Let me tell you too, a little bit about his special effects business. Escape Design FX is something that he has done for a long time, and it is in the independent film industry. Not only that, let me tell you a little bit about what he's done while he kind of shifted away from that a little bit with that in 2014. He went and spent seven out of eight episodes on Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge. But he's doing even more than that now, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that and a book that he's going to share with you. And you know I like to inspire you and get you to making healthy decisions and moving forward in your life. So there's a lot of things that are going to make your mind mm, become a little bit uh, more interested in what's going on outside of your normal today's world. Welcome to the show, Russ Adams. Welcome. Hi, thanks. I am really excited about the things that you've got going. First, I want to say thank you so much for your service. Oh, thank you. I, 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 you probably had as much fun as I did. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, I, actually, I should say raw, but I know that... <laughs> I know that that's a little bit different for you, but I also am really excited because you're an award-winning special effects um, artist and designer and even more, um, but you are amazing at what you do, and even <laughs> with you right now, you have some designs. I do. I've got some critters behind me that uh, some of them were bucket list. Uh, the other one is for a, a, a new project we're working on. Um, it's, uh, it's, I love, well, I loved my job and now I've kind of stepped away from it for a little bit, but these are some of the, uh, some of the guys we've got, I call them torso masks. Uh, they're really, really big. They kind of sit on your shoulders and make you like two feet taller. And, you know, everyone sort of gravitates their eye view to the, yes. eye of the creature. So they don't even realize that that's not your head up there. So, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> You know what, Russ, it takes a lot of creativity to do what you do, not only to think about what this is going to be, but then to actually um, take your hands and create it and yeah. put it into something solid or kind of even moving, because I think you have things that are fluid as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, animatronic uh, creatures and things like that, yeah. How do you do this? How did this start for you? To start? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so I like to tell the story about uh, when I was little, I, uh, I watched an episode of Mr. Rogers, and he's always talking about, you know, creativity and, uh, you know, how things are, um, what was he say? Oh, I pretend. He wants, you know, so kids aren't scared about some of the things they see or enjoying the pretend world and stuff. And so he went behind the scenes of The Incredible Hulk, which Lou Ferrigno was the star of uh, at that, and Bill Bids, Bixby at that time. Um, and they transformed the Hulk into, well, Lou Ferrigno into the Hulk um, with makeup effects and, you know, messing with his hair and stuff. And I was like hooked from that point on. And so it was all I wanted to do. Um, yeah. And so I just, I would, I would pick apart, you know, things, the pictures that I saw in like Fangoria magazine and whatever, you know, you could find at the comic book store or whatever to, uh, to see how things might've gone together and probably tens of thousands of dollars of trial and error. And I was able oh, to finally, my goodness. Yeah, get to this point. So. so this is pretty interesting because, you know, a lot of children at home start, using different things from tinker toys to erector sets to different things. And then they're, you know, taking old Pringle boxes and putting it over and adding water to it and flour oh, yeah. and salt and all of these things and trying to create something and then trying to get even to where you are at now. How did you end up creating your own independent film company and 
being a special effects and award-winning special effects artist? Um, it, it, it took time. Uh, you know, at first, um, there, I had gotten to the point where I felt that I was comfortable creating things um, and that I had uh, produced some work that, uh, that was catching attention. And, and, uh, and at that point I decided that, you know, I wanted to do this for a living. I had just left the military. Um, I had given up a full ride scholarship to the art Institute of Pittsburgh. Oh my, my goodness. Oh yeah. My grandfather was like, yo, you're going to end up with like a, you know, a needle in your arm and in a ditch because that's where artists end up, you know? And oh so, my gosh. Like scared me to death. And he convinced me because my whole family's military convinced me to go into the service. And so I did. And I actually loved it. Um, but when I got out, I was like, you know, I think it's my turn to do my thing. And, uh, and so I started working on some projects. I would catch some people's attention, but my problem was I had, I was married and I had two children. I couldn't just up and, you know, uproot everybody and move to LA for work. So, um, I got involved in the, uh, the independent film business in, uh, in the state of Utah and, um, slowly started working on projects. Um, uh, I actually, my first big project was 51st dates. Um, I did, uh, you know, some, some life casting stuff for, for that. Um, and then I moved up to, you know, some more independent work and then, uh, ended up working on pirates, uh, of the Caribbean two and three. And then, you know, a couple of Danny Trejo films, <laughs> they were just, it just sort of like just kept going. And then I picked up the Jim Henson show. So mm -hmm. I had started my own company to do all those things because I didn't have, you know, the ability to do it. Um, you know, uh, on location, um, and moving my whole family. So, you know, that was kind of, um, it's, it's scary cause you're in charge of everything and you really can't do it part time because the business at, you know, side of it is, um, is, is incredibly daunting. And if you're an artist, yes. most artists aren't good at business and I certainly wasn't. So, you know, I had to really force myself into, uh, into learning that, that trade, but, um, and very few artists, uh, special effects artists, have their own shop. Um, most of them do a, what we call the bounce. Um, they catch a they catch like a wave of of movies that are going through Hollywood. They're there for anywhere from like two weeks to two months, but usually okay. no. One that. And then they go to, uh, to uh, the next film. So they just sort of bounce from shop to shop, and I see. they're independent contractors. So that's, that's interesting. How it's done, but. But that just means you're you're known because you're going to be the go-to guy. You, they know that they can just go straight to you. This can be done, and it's in your shop, ready to rock and roll. They can go straight to really? you. Yeah, and we've had we've had some friends of mine from Face Off uh, working in the shop, and you know it, it, it sucks because they're always contacting me. Um, those that know me uh, are contacting me for gigs. Hey, what do you got coming up? What do you got coming up? And they never think to reciprocate, you know, like, like, Hey, yes. I might need a gig. You know, <laughs> I mean, somebody, yes. somebody throw, you know, a, you know, a bone my way, you know, but, uh, but yeah, so they, they'll call and they'll ask for, you know, like gigs. And if I've got something, I will totally take, you know, take on the help, especially if I know that they're, they're at my level or above, uh, certainly if they're above, you know, and, uh, yeah. But uh, we've had, we've had some weird gigs. I I I brought a couple of people on uh, projects, uh, uh, just commercial projects. We did this really cool um, commercial for um, the Wildlife uh, Foundation of uh, Colorado, and it was called okay. Hug, Hug the Hunter Program. And, okay. Um, so we had to create an animatronic deer. Uh, two of them. One that was puppeted at a close up. The other one was a full deer. Uh, that they could they could you know pop it from a distance um and and it was it was great because they were like the wild it was like the wily e. coyote and the sheep dog from uh, I love it from those cartoons back on the wb and they were enemies uh throughout the uh the, the day but they take their their lunch breaks together and talk like they were old friends and that's kind of the way the hug the hunter thing went they were you know, the deer hunter and the hunter uh, sorry and the deer were friends and they were on our coffee break talking about it. it was that's, ridiculous. That's pretty funny. Well, so let me ask you though. Okay, so as you're telling me this, I'm thinking, so where do all of these creatures mm -hmm. go? Do I mean, do you end up putting them in a museum? Do they stay in some set in Hollywood? Are they kind of that's kind what of happens to the creatures? When, when, when possible, we'll put in the, in the, uh, the contract that if they don't have a, um, if they don't have a purpose for it after the fact, then we will, we'll take it back and store it or, you know, put it on display or whatever. 
Um, but for the most part, Hollywood doesn't have a lot of respect for props and they will just drop them into the trash. And you're kidding. Oh, it's just like the show, uh, Jim Henson creature shop challenge. Um, they had, I think there was 30 some creatures that we had built over the entire season and uh, they were about to put them all in the garbage. And I just happened to be lucky enough to be in L.A. And the guy who won the show, Bobby, um, he, he mentioned, hey, listen, you know, all the, the creatures are down at the, 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 the creature shop and they're about to go in the trash. If you want some of yours, you know, come down and get them. And, you know, I didn't oh. budget for shipping because I was there on vacation. So I went running down uh, to, uh, to pick up. I think we got three creatures. We had them, uh, Yvonne Escato from the show had a friend that helped us get them bubble wrapped and shipped. And I had them shipped ahead of me to my studio. And, oh my uh, goodness. Yeah. Pretty much cost me everything I had for that, you know, for the show. Cause we were doing monster, Palo- a son of monster Palooza. And, uh, it was just, it was chaos, but yeah, they were going to throw everything. So I'm assuming everything else got thrown in the trash. If you weren't there. I think you were- I mean, I can just, you know, envision something like the wax museums that they have up where there would be something like your props. Oh, yeah. Creatures somewhere because they're in movies. These are these are iconic. Yeah. I mean, well, when you even look back to Jaws, I mean, the three sharks they built for Jaws ended up in a dump, you know, and I can't believe this rescued. But, you know, yeah, yeah, it's exactly it. But they, they ended up in a, in a garbage heap and somebody, a fan rescued them. And I think actually one of the, the people on the, on one of the films had actually found one and, and rescued it. But I mean, a- these kind of things, you, when you hear about it, you know that people are picking things out of the trash and selling them for major amounts of money on some auction site. And I mean, gosh, they could be displayed in a museum. People do this all the time with other yeah. things that are, yeah, a it's- piece of clothing or yeah, so we, we try to recapture, but sometimes, um, like, for instance, the, uh, the Hug the Hunter program, those guys wanted to display that um, at, at the Wildlife Foundation. Um, That's so neat. I believe that those are still kicking around. Um, but some of the stuff that you create, uh, we, we sent out another deer. I got stuck. There was one summer where I made a lot of deer, and, uh, <laughs> and it was supposed to have been hit by a car, so it had to be puppeted from underneath this car. And um, it was an Italian film that was being shot in Southern Utah and called the uh, monolith. And, um, you know, it was a really cool premise for a, a film. I don't think it's been released yet, but they were, yeah. So they were asking uh, about the deer and stuff. And I asked them, Hey, listen, if you're not going to want the, the creature afterwards, and they're like, Oh no, 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 we want it. And then I found out that they couldn't afford to ship it back and they just trashed it. And it was just mm-hmm. like, God, oh, man. In the garbage. So, yeah. Typically, how long does, and I know this is going to depend on size and things like that, and, but, it, you know, what time frame does it take to create a uh, creature? It, we never have the time that we need to create it. So I'll, okay. I'll leave with that. So for instance, um, the, the deer that we had created um, I think we had less than a month to create those. And that oh, would, wow. Yeah, that okay. would do all the research on how a deer moves and then um, how we might puppet it, how we'd put it, uh, how we'd build out the understructure to be able to puppet it and then cover it with foam for muscle oh, yeah. and all kinds of stuff and then get it to the set so it looks realistic. Paint it where it needed to be painted. Yeah. And, uh, that would have normally been a good two months worth of work. And I think we had less than a month to do it. Um, we had built, uh, like a robot, uh, for, uh, what was it? It was a Danny Trejo movie called, um, Juarez 2045. And we had, uh, we had 20 some odd days to build what was equivalent to about 26 separate types of props. One of them was a, was a nine foot Android that had to be, um, articulated. Uh, and it was like, everything was articulated down to the fingers so that, cause we thought they were going to do like a stop motion thing with it. But in real life, it was, it was like, you know, with, with the, the leg chassis and everything, it was about nine feet tall. And, oh my goodness. Yeah. And it was just, you know, we had, we had less than 20 days to do that grenades, what we called combat glass, the military gear. It was just, you know, and basically I had no one that I could hire. So I was doing all this by myself. So it was, you know, it was insane. It was like, that's pretty amazing. And I mean, and even to know what you, to use the substances to use to really 
make the things very effective. Uh, I mean, just, this is amazing. What kind of, what are you involved with right at the moment? Um, actually, we've put Escape Design Effects, uh, my, my uh, special effects company, to sleep for the last year and a half. Um, so for the last two years, we've been um, uh, working on a Comic-Con that we're bringing to, uh, to Ogden. Um, uh, so it's a pop culture convention. It covers all aspects of pop culture. Um, and, you know, we worked really closely with the city to make sure that they were on board with it. And uh, in some cases, the county, we're using a bunch of county facilities to be able to put it together. And we are now 26 days out from that two years ago when we started. And um, wow. yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I would like this to is say a big deal. that I'm like way confident, but you know, this is, <laughs> it's a scary industry. So, you know, I try not to, uh, I try not to uh, to get too cocky about things because that's usually when I get kicked in the stomach. So uh, I'm just gonna say we're holding on. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay, so this is this is a big deal, and um, you have some things that you're going to be sharing at the event as well. Something that you've authored. Uh, something at the event that I've authored. Are you, uh, are you talking about the books? Yes, it's sitting on your desk. It's sitting on my desk. Actually, the thing about the event is, as an event runner, I the only thing that I'm going to have time to do is run around like an idiot trying to make sure that everything runs well. Unfortunately, I won't have anything displayed to my own stuff. Uh, oh. Me if I was going to be a guest at my own. Oh. It. It's just, no, I will be working like for three days straight, probably a week up until. Okay. So, Yeah. I wish I could pimp my own book. I, I, we've got these little creatures we call Bitty Bigfoots. They're a small version of him. Okay. We wanted to sell them there, but we got no way to sell them because all my team has volunteered to help with the. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about that right now. Can you share that with the audience, what you've got going on in the background? Oh, um, so th these are just bucket list projects on a cake <laughs> between, you know, uh, films and commercials and stuff um you tend to to have you need to fill your time or else you go crazy so i have a like a list of bucket a bucket list of things that i always wanted to create so a big foot was How one is that? yeah it, we actually got to so i think uh dollywood has a version of him he's um uh, a creature they call stomp and he kind of like so they, they they liked our design and asked if they could utilize it for uh for a mascot and we we did that a couple of years ago. So he's been kicking around a while. We make copies of him all the time. Um, I think that one was like blonde and this guy's all grayed out and stuff. Um, we've done uh, like a solid black and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's, it's just a fun project. Uh, and then behind me uh, over in here is the, uh, the killer croc. And uh, he was one of the DC comic uh, characters I wasn't really thrilled with the way they portrayed him in uh, Suicide Squad, so I decided to create him myself the way he should look. <laughs> I so, love it. I love it. Yeah. So, and then this fellow over here, uh, by the you know, um, essentially uh, we created him uh, as a costume for the Comic Con um, for Ogden Uncon, and um, we were trying to figure out who we we're going to put in it. Well, we actually built this one for the mayor of the uh, the city, so. We, oh yeah you know so he's been he's the first as far as i i know he is the first cosplaying mayor in 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 in, in the united states as far as i know so he's this, and uh, this is so much fun i oh, mean yeah. you, you've got some ideas and you're bringing things to the table that that hasn't been done and this is really exciting i am really excited to share a lot of the things that you are currently doing with our viewers and some yeah. things that you're going to have coming um in the future so for the moment i do want to share with the viewers uh your book and a couple of the other things that you have and how they can get in contact with you to learn more about what you've got going to go to your event and also to get copies of your, your book and the other, the other ones that you have, cause you have three other ones in, in addition to what you're going to show the audience today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yes. so the book, see the book I wrote uh, an expose, uh, you know, a tell all about what happened behind the scenes of the Jim Henson creature shop challenge. And um, I think people already realize that when, you know, reality shows are, you know, are on, you, you know, that there's an element to it that's not completely on the up and up. Um, and so I think you watch it with a bit of skepticism, but what I don't what I don't think they realize is just how 
unbelievably, you know, insane and, 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 you know, it is behind the scenes. Now, uh-huh. Building all the creatures was 100%. Uh, we had less than, we, in some cases, two to three days, but that was translated into about 10 hours a day for two or three days to build these. Wow. Things. Under intense pressure, um, no ability to, um, you know, uh, research and develop a project before you were actually able, you were just, once you were given the stuff, you were on it. And um, big creatures, like um, I think our final creature was uh, with Bobby and Yvonne. We created this g- Russian gorilla looking creature and it was, a, it was eight feet tall. It was, I mean, we had a guy inside of it. I was running the uh, animatronics from off, uh, off the set. Sometimes like right behind the bar, I'm laying down, looking at a screen, you know, crouched down in this little bar. Oh my gosh. And there was like a puppeted element to it. It was, uh, it was insane. And we, we literally built that in three days. So, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, no time to, to, to develop it. I mean, but as you went on, it got a little easier because you're kind of, okay. but some of the stuff that happened behind the scenes that I don't think people would believe was like our living conditions. I mean, we were living in studio, uh, studio city. Um, we, uh, you know, it was, it was in an affluent neighborhood and it was a mansion, but the mansion had been abandoned for a long period of time or better yet, not lived in for a period of time. To the point where there were roots growing into the uh, t- to the plumbing, and like you you couldn't use the circuit breakers were bad. So if you were cooking, if you oh. were and using the microwave, it would trip the breaker. So we always had to have somebody manning the breaker while we were working in the kitchen on almost anything. Um, every time we used the stove, uh, the the smoke alarm would go off, and it wasn't like a normal smoke alarm. It would just start screaming um fire you know evacuate fire evacuate it became so so normal that we had these fans you know like cardboard just trying to blow smoke out of the windows so that we could actually make something to eat you know for (laughs) but it was bad uh the the shower the toilet would back into the shower of the Uh the house you know so the ladies are taking and you know taking a shower and all of a sudden there's this stuff backing up into it um it was insane we had an in-ground pool but it had like these, when we first got there, there's these two dead rats that I make jokes about suicide rats, you know, that were in the, uh, in the, in the, in the pool. I mean, it was, it was, oh, the, gosh. it was the most ghetto, um, uh, you know, uh, cast house I think I've ever <laughs> seen, but yeah. No, oh, nobody, gosh. Okay. Nobody knows mm-hmm. stuff like that. So, so you share all this in your book. Uh huh. Do you have a copy of it there? You can hold up. I think I do. Um, yeah, so it's called uh, Surviving Reality. This is not that show. I love it. A loaded title. I mean, Surviving Reality was just fun. I just sort of like, you know, came up with that one uh, and, the, and the publisher liked it. That this is not that show. We had this snide uh, little British, um, you know, you know, I'm trying not to swear, uh, you know, uh, producer who also produced Project Runway. And he had this chip okay. shoulder. Like he was, he was terrified of, uh, of, um, uh, face off, which was our sister show on sci-fi. And, um, and like, so is a brand new show. So we would ask him questions like, uh, are you, uh, are we going to be doing this? Like they do on, on, on uh, face off, or are we going to do it like this? And all he had to say was, this is not that show. This is not that show. Oh, you know? oh. You know, this tiny person who got smaller and smaller every time he whined about something, you know, it was just, ouch. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, so that's, that was just my little dig at him, but <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, you have three other books as well. Uh-huh. And, um, we, do you want to mention those or shall we just sure. send the audience um, to, yeah, I do a series of books called, uh, a workshop with Russ Adams. Um, uh, there's a latex, uh, mask making workshop. There is a, uh, f- creature fur and hair where I talk about, like um, a lot of people don't know, this isn't like fur that, that was uh, cut and then, you know, put onto a creature. Each one of those hairs was put in one at a time with a needle. And um, so I teach how to do that, how to make your own tool to do that, how to work with fur on, on a bolt, you know, that way you, you know how to work with that. Um, and then flocking methods that uh, um, kind of like, it's the soft velvet stuff that's usually under like, you know, uh, you know, tchotchkes and stuff that so it doesn't scratch you know, the surface of something, but you can use that for long versions of it as fur. So different methods. I love of it. And then the I last one was shrunken heads. So I, and I even go into a little detail of how it was actually done, um, you know, in the Amazon and uh, 
you know, so warning, you know, (laughs) this is, this is pretty neat. So how can the audience get copies of your book and find out about the upcoming event that you have? Okay. I'm going to hold for just a second for, uh, believe it or not, I'm in a rather soundproof area, but I'm in my studio. That just tells me that people need to be on alert for what you have coming. (laughs) And I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, there's, um, oh, so, uh, so you got, uh, they can get copies of my book on Amazon. Um, I think, uh, there's also a, uh, uh, right now there's an ebook version of surviving reality. Um, and we're working on an audio book. Um, I feel like as the author of a book and, and as you would know, I think your, your voice as the author is sometimes the best to do those audio books. Um, yes. My problem is, is I know what I've written and I don't necessarily read it. And so sometimes I have <laughs> yeah. to bring me back on. I know that. I know. So, yeah. So the, the audio book's taken a while, you know? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. And any, any other websites you want to direct them to? Uh, yeah, you could definitely check out um, OgdenUncon.com. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, what is it? <laughs> OG. <laughs> N U N C O N dot com. You know, sometimes right. people have a problem with the word Ogden. They're not sure how to spell it. But um, so, uh, and then Escape Design Effects is so the letter uh, Escape Design with the letters FX at the end uh, dot com is my uh, special effects company. And you can see some of the stuff that we're, you know, what we had worked on. <laughs> Nothing new and, yet. And you can see some of your work at sci fi.com forward slash creature shop. And there's seven of the eight episodes there. So there's a lot of information that we can find out about you, follow you and uh, stay on board. Cause I think what your imagination, it inspires creativity in other people. And this is something that in our world right now, we really need is to bring back our imagination. Like yes, what happened? What's, when you were with Mr. Rogers watching and you developed yours, we forget that. And especially as adults, we lose that. We feel like we have to be in this box where every day we get up and we do certain things because we're adults and we're no longer allowed to have fun. But part of the thing about moving forward and making progress in our lives is being able to use our imagination, having fun with our lives. And so I want to thank you so much for being on our show today to thank inspire you. people. And I really want to encourage them to follow you and um, attend the event as well as get a copy of some of your books. Oh, yeah. yeah. The copy of the books would be great. I'd love everyone to come out to Ogden Uncon. I, I think so too. Time. But cool. All right. So Ogden Uncon it is in just 26 days from now, and we want to invite you to that as well as invite you to, you know, encourage your friends, your family, coworkers, people you don't know, everybody on social media, not only to attend Ogden Uncon, but get a copy of Russ Adams' books as well as follow him on social media, go to the websites, and check this out. Open up your imagination. Definitely. Let- Yes, and tantalize your mind. We don't do this often enough. Thank you, Russ, for being on the show today. Uh, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Well, I've got to tell you, what a delight this episode is going to be? Well, why? I know we have spoke about finances before, but have we talked really in depth about what it is in reference to credit cards and the younger generation? Do we get credit cards for them? How do they know what to do when they use them? What about debt? How do they pay for them? Well, today with me, I have a guest who is an expert in a lot of areas when it comes to finances. But we're going to talk really in depth about specific things when it comes to the younger generation and credit cards. Well, he is a senior, he, oh gosh, he is a senior advisor and founding partner with Arc Financial Group. And yes, 
I've got to tell you, Texas is big when it comes to knowing about finances. You've heard all for many years about, oh, big oil and lots of millionaires coming out of Texas. Well, you got to know about finances to make things happen, right? And so this is a boutique financial planning firm, and they specialize in business and personal finance, financing, so financial planning. And so this is really important because, well, how do you move ahead if you don't know where you stand or have a goal in where to make the direction flow? This is really important because the word flow is also really important in finances. There's a lot of things to learn about when it comes to finances, but it's really important to have somebody who's an expert in the field. And my guest today has really an extensive experience in this area, very intricate solutions to problems that pop up that sometimes we don't necessarily think about. And really, we need solutions. We don't want to face challenges that come up or um, even just, I don't know, little bumps along the road um, that could turn into major hurdles. So if we have someone that's guiding us and mentoring us and really has the expertise in the areas that we need, even even just little things can really make a difference in the direction that we go. With me today is Jeff Soha. Again, he's from Arc Financial Group. He's got a huge, huge expertise and resume in this area. I'm going to let him share a lot of that information with you because who is better about sharing their background than the person who has it? So with me today, I welcome Jeff. So, uh, welcome to the show. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited because your background is absolutely huge. You are involved in so many things from political things, but all of this connects. And I really want you to describe your background because it's so extensive, but it is so in-depth and so important. It's not just about, okay, let me take today's family and put it put their individual planning into uh, into fruition and let that flow because it extends. It's a ripple effect that, like we talked about, goes on into bigger things that affect, actually turn around, come back, and affect the individual. And so I want you to share a little bit about your background before we go into some of this major stuff. Sure. So our approach to financial planning and financial consulting is really from a problem solving, almost engineering base. So I just think about engineering as what are the variables? What are the resources we have? What are we trying to accomplish? And then let's engineer that solution. And in our world, there's such a lack of education and knowledge just across the board that people don't know where to start to put that solution together. And so finding great help is key to that success. I have to agree with you because oftentimes we look at something and are really unclear on the right direction to go. And if we have a solution and somebody that knows what they're doing that can offer even options that are right for me or right for that particular individual, which is something that you do because you look at the individual and look at what is the profitability for that specific client. And I think that that's really important because oftentimes there's big companies that just are looking at, okay, let me get my numbers. And it's not about that. Your company is really specific you really want to help the individual in the direction that they want to go yeah that's if it's not purpose driven then why are you doing it Mm -hmm. so and the thing is with your background too you're a graduate of texas a&m and so you've taken a lot of time in your background i don't know how exactly in your younger years that you decided that this was the area that you wanted to pursue? Well, so I hired my first financial advisor when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family owned construction company. I was working as far back as I can remember and, you know, earning an income for the hours I was putting in. 
And as I started to save, I remember I was about 15 years old and already saved up thousands of dollars. And I remember telling my dad, hey, uh, do you have a financial advisor? I need somebody to come over and help me figure out what, what do I do with this? And so a uh, financial advisor came over and I think it just all got started from there. I so love it. I, I really do because oftentimes we don't think that the younger generation thinks about money. And yeah. here you were at 15 years old already acquiring wealth and then thinking about, okay, what do I do with this so that I don't lose this money, but I can benefit long term from this. And I need to talk to somebody about the best steps to take to do so. This is pretty neat. Well, it's not just the younger people that aren't thinking about it. I think if we look around, we can find plenty of people at all ages and at all levels in this country that aren't mm -hmm. giving it the time and attention it deserves. Well, let me ask you too, your degree in finance and engineering, that you would think that these are two areas that are so far off the spectrum, but you've integrated these two in what you do now. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm really good at engineering, but I'm a lot more passionate about finance. So when you bring an engineering approach to solving financial problems, uh, or just solving the problem of how to attain or uh, reach your financial goals, then you're going to have a much better outcome than just what happens, unfortunately, in most of the industry, which is you have a bunch of people running around saying they're financial advisors, and they're not qualified to be financial advisors. So they're out there pitching you and selling you, and they're just, they're just out there going, how can I get more of your money into some financial product, some investment portfolio? some insurance product, which isn't necessarily bad. It's not inherently bad, but if it's absent of a plan, if it's absent of a purpose, then why are you doing it? I think that that's a really good point because there's a lot of companies out there that are taking people and saying, Hey, we can put you through this quick program and then go out and find a whole bunch of your friends and family and sign them up. And it may be a starting point for some people to look at their finances but they really need somebody who has a background in this that knows what they're doing because you can really take the wrong steps and the direction that you go doesn't lead you where you need to be in the long term. And so, like you said, I mean, it can be an eye opener and you can start thinking, OK, well, now I, need, I really need to be thinking about this. But you have something that has become nationally recognized. Can you share with us a little bit about that? I'm not sure what specifically you're talking about has been nationally recognized, but uh, we're, we're definitely starting to get a lot more recognition around the country. We're getting a lot more uh, press. Uh, we're getting invited onto shows like this to talk about what we do and why it's different. Um, it's unfortunate that in today's um, business world and, and even with all of the information available that in this industry, just transparency and honesty can be a differentiator. So sometimes I think the work that we're doing, there's not some magic silver bullet or some secret sauce. It's really just about being honest and transparent and going, how can we help these clients get what they want? This is not a new principle, right? Help other people get what they want in life and you'll get everything you want out of life. I so love it. I so love it. I want to talk to you a little bit about the credit card issue and a little bit about debt when it comes to credit cards. And so maybe you can share a little bit about that, especially when it comes to the younger generation. Sure. So I think debt is a important tool uh, when used correctly. Debt is also um, a financial tool that can really hurt you. Uh, in 2008, most of the people that were hurt were hurt because of how they used debt in their lives. Mm -hmm. Businesses that were hurt were hurt because of how they managed debt in their business. You know, our country has a challenge with debt, 
but they also have this unique opportunity in that they can just print more money. So they well, can, continue, whereas those of us who operate in the real world, you know, debt can hurt us or it can help us. So it's important that we know how to use it responsibly and know how to be a good steward if we're going to use it. So just like we were talking earlier about learning and finances as children or at a younger age, it's it, what's clear to me that that younger people are not being educated on finance is just look at the debt with student loans. Okay. Okay. If you're going to take out a loan of say a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars of debt, and you're going to do that so that you can get a job that pays say forty thousand dollars a year coming out of college. There's a lot of okay where you could go earn $40,000 coming right out of a trade school and be debt free. And so now you've got this ball and chain tied to you that's strapped to you, holding you down, preventing you from progressing because you borrowed against your future. And now the earnings that you're making are all going to pay for that decision in the past. And so yes. when, when you think about your kids and should I get them a credit card it's not necessarily just about, like we were saying earlier, whether it's, well, more convenient than giving them cash for lunch money. It's a tool that you should be teaching your children how this can help them and how it can also hurt them. So they need to understand where the money came from. You should review the bill with them. They should see that it has to get paid. They really need to understand how everything's connected so that they can make better decisions in the future about do I really need this enough to borrow against my future and put this in, put myself in debt? Well, that's a really good point. And I think one thing, um, having a parent, had been a parent that has gone through this where my child has gone into adulthood, another thing is to teach them the responsibility that comes with it, not just giving them the money and showing them, but having them be accountable for some of the, the earnings in this so that there's some type of value placement in that yeah. and understand that, okay, I had to work X amount of doll hours for this amount of dollars. And now what is this going to entail with where it goes? And oftentimes I know that when I, as a young mother, we wanted to provide for our children because of the amount of work that we had to go through and we didn't want to see them have to do this. And so we work a little bit more lax. And so the younger generation really didn't have to do as much. And I think that society is seeing um, some challenges in this arena because the, when you look at education now, some of the education systems across the nation are not teaching maybe in-depth finances and some of the tools. So this really needs to go back to the parents where we are teaching our children how to deal with finances. And much like you, we can say, let's go to a financial expert too. And let's talk about the credit card or let's talk about this and see how much in savings and what you need to do to get where you want to go. Hey, do you want, what kind of car do you want? And some of them will say, I'd like to drive a BMW or Mercedes Benz or whatever. I mean, you know, you dream big when you're young. Yeah. And so not all families come from a position where they can provide that for their child. And so either the parent has to work an extra job or the child has to do something so that they can pursue that dream and fulfill it. And I think that this is a great opportunity with what you bring to the table. And it brings a new approach, a new perspective, where actually our younger generation can begin to fulfill these goals and acquire a sense of responsibility and direction that I think we've kind of in some ways missed the boat on. But there's more to what you have to say because this goes all the way up the, ch the chain, the food chain, if you will, into the finances as a whole of our nation. That's right. And you hit on something that's really important there. You talked about kind of the value of a dollar and connecting 
hard work and earning a dollar to being able to pay that credit card bill and recognizing that when you swipe that, connecting that back to the effort you had to put in to earn the money so that you can pay that bill later. And this is an evolution just in our financial system. You know, in, if we, we could go all the way back to uh, bartering, right? Like, oh, I, yes. I grew some crops. Well, I know how hard it was to grow these crops and you are raising livestock and we're going to make an exchange. We both know how hard it was. And when we see that fruit of our labor that we're exchanging, it's really challenging. Well, so then we move on to a currency system, right? And you had that physical, tangible nature of cash. Hey, Rebecca, look, I'm giving you this cash and I know what I had to do to get the cash. So by physically giving it away, it stirs up a certain level of emotion and and brain activity, really. Yes. Then we move to checkbooks, right? And then now we're in a digital age where money is just numbers on, on an internet screen. And so then we get to these credit cards and this plastic. And here's this, I don't know, you can think about it as scary if you want, but these financial institutions have done studies to register how much brain activity you have when you make these different types of transactions, cash, check, credit card. So it's no wonder that what you're starting to see now is you don't even have to swipe something or insert a card. Now you just wave your phone. Or okay. You wave your phone and you just have this, this, this waving motion of your phone doesn't register as much in your brain as actually swiping the credit card, which is why you're seeing that transition happen now. I can understand that. They want to be able to extract the money from you without you even realizing that you're giving it away, right? See, people out there in the country wants your money, but they want to make it as easy as possible for you to give it to them so that you don't connect the pain of, oh, remember how hard it was at my job last week? Do I really, all that work I put in, do I really want to spend that on this purchase? Maybe not. It's so true. And my thought as you were talking about this is how things are evolving into Bitcoin or the online currency type of thing. And so there is no connection, like you said, to the hard labor and the work that you've done. And so we take things, but we, you can see this. It has been evolving into this non-connection level to many, many things, but finance is one of them. We live in an ATM society which is now evolving into, and I've said this for years, so now I've got to say into the, into the wave society. Yeah. So this is a new one for me. I, I'm really glad that you pointed this out because now we have graduated and I've been doing this for a long time and talking about this. And now I've got this new thing I can say. Thank yeah. you, Jeff, because it's so funny that you have really pointed that out. We live in a wave society, which means bye-bye. And we yeah. can say bye-bye to our money. It's gone. Um, and how do we connect? No emotion. Yeah. And one day we, no emotion. We have no emotional attachments to things anymore. We don't have emotional attach, attachments even to people because like you and I, we're on video and people do this all the time. And there's just nothing, there's no connection that way because there's no physical. And that's the, I mean, even talking about the physicalness of paper currency. And so we do, we don't connect it. And then one day we look at our bank account on our phone and we go, why isn't there money there? Yeah. And we, and we are now seeing a lot of challenges. And I think you would be an expert in seeing the prediction of what's happening with the real estate again and where it's going. And there's a lot of things that if people are not paying attention to because of how easy our money is slipping through our fingers. Right. Or our phones right. or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah, you can just uh, tap a button on your phone and use Apple Pay. You know, you don't even need, you don't even have to have the card anymore. Yes, yeah. and so I really like the focus that you have on educating the younger generation because if we don't, things are slipping through their fingers. It's it, like you said, it's the wave. It's it's gone. And how do you pursue your dreams when you're not being connected with the right tools to get you there in the society that we live in. And this is really important. And I like what you're challenging, you know, it and, is. and when you think about the attachment and the connection that you're talking about, you know, when you're out there 
spending cash and you have this physical exchange. Somewhere deep inside of us in this country, we all seem to be wired very well for budgeting. Everybody mm -hmm. seems to hate budgeting and think it's this negative four letter word. But really, most people in the country are experts. It's magical how good they are at budgeting because they can spend all of their money right down to zero. Mm -hmm. See, if you and I don't make the same amount of money, but we can both spend it right down to zero. And so everybody in the country, even though they might make different income levels, they're great at spending exactly what they have. And so what happens is when you're on a cash system, you spend what you have, and then when you're out, you're out, and, and you need to get more cash, right? Well, so with the involvement of you know credit cards and then now things like Apple Pay where you can just wave, it's like, oh, hey, Rebecca, I want to buy something. I want to buy another thing, you know, and and you're not even connecting to the fact that you may or may not have that money. Yes. So then what happens is because we're great at spending right down to zero in our checking account or our bank account, so we spend right down to zero, credit card statement shows up, and we act all surprised. Yes. Come from. How did it yes. get that high? Yes. How and am you I supposed to pay this? I don't have any cash to pay this. Yes. And when you started speaking about this, you brought something to mind. I love people and I love learning about how we're wired. And there's something that I learned a long time ago in psychology, and that is there's something called attachment disorder. And that is where when in the early stages of life, if you don't bond with your parent, specifically your mother, there is an attachment disorder and it later causes like behavioral problems and things like that. But you mentioned this attachment and if we are not attached or we haven't attached to hard labor and the emotions that are connecting us to money, we have an attachment disorder to money that causes us behavioral problems in our spending. So this is what I was thinking as you were saying this. And a lot of us then are really actually having sort of a crisis in essence overall because these, and then if you think in terms of long-term habit, habitual things, because we are creatures of habit, right? So we will continue to do as we have done in the past and we can't get beyond it. It's, and then we go where, like you said, okay, I'm at zero. How did I get here? This should have been here. Yeah. Uh, Why? What do I do? So I think there are so many solutions that are available. And if we talk to someone who's an expert in this field, such as yourself, who can say, here's the way to do this, that's going to get you where you need to go. This is productive. This is healthy. Take these steps provides a way, a pattern, a good look, a good perspective, you're going to do really, really well. Yes. yes. So I think on the topic of credit cards for your children, set a limit and use it as a tool for education. Teach them about it. it, help them connect to where the money came from, review the statement with them, Make sure that they understand the exchange that's taking place, that there is a physical exchange that affects your physical life when you swipe that credit card, and you need to understand that exchange. I, I think a tool, that. a very fundamental basic tool that goes back to the detachment disorder, the behavioral issues you're talking about, if there is one thing that I think would change people's lives financially, it would be to automate this financial discipline. Oh, the, yes. The way that you automate financial discipline is you get it out of sight, out of mind. So whatever bank account that you're used to logging in, because we look at our bank accounts far more than any other financial account, more so than any kind of retirement account or other benefit account or other any, any other type of financial account. We don't log in as much. People log in and they look at their bank accounts online far more often. So what you've got to do is get the money out of the bank account so you don't see it. So your subconscious does not kick in and start thinking of all the amazing, wonderful things you could do with that number that just flashed up on the screen. Yes. You've got to get 
money automated to where when it's coming out of your business or coming out of your paycheck, but maybe before it even gets to your checking account, it goes to some other financial institution, just some other saving account, some other investment account that you don't see, that you're not looking at, that you're not logging into. So it's out of sight, out of mind. I don't care if it's another savings account, just at a different bank but get it out of that main account, get it out of that main bank that you're working with that you log into on a regular basis. So you don't see that balance in front of you. And if, and if you can't get it out before it hits the bank, set up an automated withdrawal every time you get paid. I get yeah. paid every week, every two weeks, once a month, whatever it is, set it up and get it out of there. And then your natural instinctive ability, I don't know, maybe we learned it from our ancestors because I couldn't trade you more crops for than I had. You know? So maybe it's just wired into us that we know not to, to get rid of more than what we have. So then by automating that discipline, if you end up spending everything in your bank account, you're, you're, not, you're not totally at a loss because you've got this automated transfer, this automated financial discipline to help overcome that behavioral issue. Yes, yes, I agree. And your company, and you specifically work with individuals to help them do this? So it depends. There's gotta be an economy of scale, right? Okay. If you're just getting started, you don't need a financial planner. Start with okay. the Automate your finances, get your savings going, fund your IRAs, do the basics, fund your retirement accounts. You don't need to pay anybody. You just need the discipline. And I'm not a counselor, so I can't, I can't fix all the behavioral uh, issues. Sure. You know? But once you've got the basics down and you're ready to go to the next level, that's when you reach out to someone like us. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I want to thank you so much for being with me today and with the audience. I think that you've given us a lot of insight. I want to invite you to come back on the show because we have a whole lot more to talk about. This is something that I think really needs to be addressed all the time, our finances. And you have a lot of information and a lot of different directions on which we can acquire a lot of knowledge that is going to benefit us. And I want to make sure that our viewers can get in touch with you and learn more about what you and your financial arc financial group does so that you can really address some of the specific challenges and hurdles that people face. So if you'll share a little bit of information with our viewer, viewers on how they can get in touch with you. Yeah. Well, since you're getting into Instagram now, Rebecca, they can find us on Instagram. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> find our arc financial page on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook like our pages you can find more information we're regularly sharing information on linkedin facebook instagram go out there you can check out of course our website arcfinancial.com and uh, find all of our latest blogs or articles we post up uh, interviews that i do like this so people can can hear more of what i had to share fantastic thank you so much for being with me today thank you for having me rebecca i really enjoyed it I did too, and I know that the audience did. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I'm really excited about the information that was shared with you today, and I hope that you are able to acquire some things that are going to inspire you to get excited about your finances instead of looking at it as kind of a downer. So share this with your friends, your family, your coworkers, and everybody you know on social media. This is an area that we really want to get moving in the right direction. And even if you're already there, we can always learn more and help others.